Well, hey, what's up, everybody? Matthew here. Today, we're going to talk about a very controversial topic. We're going to look at the reformed view on alcohol, drinking alcohol. Now, I'm going to put this under my reformed view playlist, which means it's going to go in a set of other videos that I have where I talk about the standard reformed confessional i.e. the Presbyterian view on a number of issues, all kinds of issues, doctrinal and otherwise. But I want to be honest and say that there's probably not a one simple reformed view on the drinking of alcohol. Now, probably Presbyterians have the reputation of drinking a little bit more freely than, for instance, our Baptistic friends or some of our non-denominational friends, certainly some of those uh, Christian movements that have come more out of the holiness or pietistic movement may have some kind of aversion to drinking alcohol. They may actually drink alcohol in their private lives, but at least outwardly they're against it on paper, so to speak. But the Reformed have typically had a little bit closer of a reputation to those of our Lutheran or Anglican or Roman Catholic friends, wherein the drinking of alcohol, as long as it's not unto drunkenness and stupidity, is usually permitted and not thought of as intrinsically evil. Now, when I say intrinsically evil, please understand I mean something that is evil in and of itself all the time, 100%, like pornography would be intrinsically e evil. Um, but other things are a, l a little bit more situation variable. So, for instance, eating food is not a sin, but gluttony is. And so we're going to have to look at the biblical data then and find out what the Reformed view is. And again, there's probably no one standard Reformed view on this particular topic. And to a large part, it is to the person's conscience and discretion and even some of their own predispositions. But what we're going to do in this video is we're going to sample the biblical data because there's a lot of biblical data to look at. In fact, in this video, I'm going to share screen quite a bit and we're going to look at a lot of Bible verses. I did this a few years ago, actually, maybe 10 years or more now when I was really thinking through this issue for myself. My wife and I were thinking through this issue. We'd been invited to some dinner parties and such, and we hadn't really drank much before that. But then occasionally a glass of wine would be offered to us or something like that. And we had to think through the moral issues of whether or not that would be right to accept it given especially that I am a pastor by vocation and down in the South, I didn't want to do anything. This was back when I was in Florida. That would bring a detrimental reputation to myself or my ministry or especially the church or to Christ. So we really had to think through this issue. And what my wife did is we went through, my wife and I, I should say, we went through the biblical data and we looked at pretty much all the occurrences of the word wine. And what we noticed is, and I'm going to show you that in this video, that it's pretty evenly split between positive references, negative references, and neutral references. So I'm going to take you through all that, and then at the end we're going to make some, uh, some additional considerations that might help you think through this topic. Now, let's go ahead and share screen here, and let's start off with the negative reasons, or those things that would seem to prohibit the use of alcohol. In other words, this first set of texts, of course, are going to be those that probably should suggest you should not drink alcohol given its dangers, okay? So negative uses. First of all, one of the first occurrences of alcohol comes early on in Genesis chapter 9. This is the story of Noah and his drunkenness. Now notice that this is chapter 9. This is subsequent to him coming off of the ark. God delivers him through the flood judgments and the covenant sign of the rainbow, etc. But look at this. When Noah gets off the ark, Genesis chapter 9, Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. All these verses are in the King James today. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, if that's all we had in the scriptures, we might think that wine is very, very dangerous and probably something that we should stay away from. Same thing, too, just a couple chapters later in Genesis chapter 19, Lot um, gets drunk and his daughters take advantage of him. This is one of those strange passages in the Old Testament where it seems to be that the female is the one taking sexual advantage of the male. Usually in cases of sexual imposition, it's the other way around. But here, it's his, their drinking of wine, the father's drinking of wine, Lot's drinking of wine in verse 33 of chapter 19. They made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and she perce he perceived not when she lay down and when she arose. So because of his drunkenness, he commits a, a very um, gross and vile sin, although <clears throat> his whether or not his conscience was operable at that point, I, I suppose we could, we could debate that. But nevertheless, that's what's happened, and incest takes place, and conception takes place, and thus we have the origin story of the Ammonites and the Moabites. 
We also see something of wine as a symbol for judgment throughout the scriptures. There's something like this motif of drinking from the cup of the wrath of God. So, for instance, in Psalm 75, verse 8, we have this. For in the hand of the Lord, there's a cup, and the wine in it is red. It is a full mixture, and he poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. So in the Old Testament, in a couple places in the New Testament as well, whenever someone is said to drink of the cup of the wrath of the Lord, that is something you do not want to drink because presumably you are going to pay severe consequences for the guilt of your sin. We're also warned multiple times in the Bible that wine and strong drink has very much power over us and it causes us to do all kinds of things that would be sinful for sure. For instance, Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So if you want to be a wise person, then you should not be deceived by the power of wine and strong drink, for goodness sakes. You don't want to be one who loses control of your faculties and falls into all kinds of possible sins. So the Proverbs warns us against it. Same thing too in Proverbs chapter 23. Notice this, it even hints to, I think, the, the concept of wine's addictive power. So it is alluring. Proverbs 23, verse 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Now, in the first verse, 31, it's talking about the attractive qualities of wine. If you look up the word addiction in the Bible, it's probably not going to be there, if at all. Because it's kind of a modern concept of a person getting latched on to a particular thing that has some sort of even chemical addictive power. But the concept here, though, is that it does have the power of allure, and it certainly does draw in. But notice what happens when one is drawn in, verse 32. It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It's strong, it's dangerous, toxic, and perhaps even deadly is assumed there. In Ecclesiastes, what we see here is that it is vain to seek real happiness by means of wine or strong drink. So the writer here, probably Solomon, says, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold of folly till I might see what was the good of the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their lives. Now, this comes in the context of that passage in chapter 2 in Ecclesiastes, where the writer tries everything to bring happiness and joy to his heart, and he cannot find that real, sustaining, lasting joy. So if you are trying to find happiness by means of this or any of the other things, money, success, power, sexuality that he explores in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, you're not going to find it there, okay? So that's another warning text. Moreover, in the New Testament, one of the things that we see is that for officers of the church, they should be especially careful to not fall into the traps of the same, i.e. those things that we've already discussed in the previous verses. So first, first Timothy chapter 3 gives us this warning. Moreover, he, that is the deacon, must have a good report of them that are without, <clears throat> lest he fall into reproach of the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, that is to say serious, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or of filthy lucre. Okay, so a deacon in the church, a leader in the, in the church, should not be the kind of person who falls prey to all of the tempting, addicting, and um, dismantling powers of wine and strong drink. Okay, so that much is clear. So when we do a summary of the negative uses of alcohol, it becomes pretty clear that there is a lot of negative connotation that would cause the Holy Spirit-filled and conscientious Christian to try to avoid it, okay? So warnings of drunkenness, warnings of shame or the defiling of one's character and reputation, obvious connotations with sexual immorality, warnings of judgments and wrath, uh, all kinds of different warnings about the impairments of one's character and life and habits and attitude, and of course, even a violence. Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. In other words, you're much more likely to get your, your face busted in under these certain um, contexts, right? Okay, so that's kind of a summary of what we might call the negative view, uh, uses of alcohol. And again, if that's all we had in the Bible, then it would be a pretty clear case of prohibition, I think, just by way of implication. However, one of the interesting things that we notice as we do a more full study of wine and alcohol is that it's not quite as easily so. So let's go back to our presentation here. 
and let's look at some of what we might call the positive uses of alcohol. Now, this may surprise you, especially for some of you who are of the Baptistic type and maybe more strict holiness, pietistic movement. You might not have even noticed some of the positive implications regarding alcohol here, but we're going to look at them today. So if the first couple of passages, we've, had, we've got Noah getting drunk and stupid, we've got Lot getting drunk and stupid, but right between those two, in Genesis chapter 14, we have a much more positive commendation of alcohol. Look at the case of Melchizedek. And he, in Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, this text almost has a sacramental value to it, doesn't it? He brings forth bread and wine. And, and not only that, but uh, Melchizedek is that typological Christ-like figure um, who does not come from the Levitical kingship or the Levit Levitical priestship, I should say. And that's kind of the point in Hebrews, why Melchizedek is like a type of Christ who himself is of the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of, of Levi. Now, it's not a full out commendation of alcohol here, but it's certainly a much more positive that use than what we saw with the case of Noah and Lot. But there are some places in which its use, that is of alcohol, is positively commended. For instance, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place where he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of, the uh, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So here alcohol is actually commended. Not only that, a couple of verses later, thou shalt bestow that money for whatever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul desire, and thou shalt eat therefore before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. Now, this is interesting because it's in the context of a person, if you read the context here, who lives too far from the temple or the tabernacle and cannot bring his tithe all the way that far. It's laborious for him to do so. So what does he do? Well, he's supposed to then rejoice before the Lord, including the commendation to drink wine or strong drink and rejoice before the Lord. Okay, so there's a, there's a positive recommendation of it there. Not only that, but we do see wine as an offering in the Old Testament as well. So for instance, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 13 the meat thereof shall be two tenths deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hin. Now, the idea with the offerings is that they are pleasing to the Lord thy God. And if something was intrinsically evil, then of course you could not bring that as an offering before the Lord. All of the offerings are typological of Christ, who is perfect and beautiful and acceptable to the, to the Father. And so, in as much as the offerings point to Jesus, who is the one true and final sacrifice, uh, they are good and they are pleasing and they are acceptable to the Lord. So it would be hard to argue that wine or drinking of wine is intrinsically wrong. In fact, it seems to be something that is pleasing to the Lord in this way. And not only that, but in some of the poetic texts, we have a very laudatory language of wine or strong drink. That is something that the Lord has given to people for the sake of gladdening the heart. So look at Psalm 4, verses 6 and 8. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time of their corn and their wine increased. Now, the time where your corn and your wine increases, the harvest time when the crops are su successful, that's a very joyful time. And the psalmist writer here says, the Lord is the one who brings joy more so than that kind of joy. But notice that he does use the joy of wine as a some, something of like a simile for those who would who would be glad. Uh, next verse, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Okay, here's another one from Psalm 104 regarding gladness. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Now notice that the he here in verse 14 is God. So God is the one who giveth the wine that maketh glad the heart of man. Okay, so it seems to be something of a gift that God does give us from time to time to bring about a cheerfulness or the gladness of heart, especially when it's used appropriately and responsibly. Ecclesiastes 9, same book that we referred to earlier, says, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Okay, so a person who is justified, a person who is saved, a person who is redeemed of the Lord, 
can go and have the joy of drinking bread and drinking wine. Let thy garments always be white and let thy head lack no ointment. In other words, be a joyful person. Be the kind of person that's glad of heart and cheerful. You're a Christian, for goodness sakes. Not only that, but in the Song of Solomon, a book, of course, which is highly typological of Christ and his love for the church, uh, the beloved and the lover representing Christ and the church respectively here, at least according to the Reformed and Puritan interpretation of that book, says this. Uh, this is right off the beginning of the book, chapter 1, verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Again, wine used as a strong simile for something very good. In this case, it's like the love of the Lord Jesus for the people of his church, okay? Now, even in Messiah's reign, when we look at some of the messianic passages, like in, for instance, Isaiah chapter 55, a strongly messianic text, we notice here that wine is part of the joy of his kingdom. So Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, that he hath no, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So here, um, the free the free thing that is given is analogous to the gospel itself, okay? So come and buy this water, buy this wine, buy this milk without price. It's good. It's free. The Lord loves you and he gives it to you. That's, of course, pointing to the gospel of the Lord. And here it's compared even to like wine. Now, Jesus, when we examine his own life and behavior, one of the things that we see is that our Lord clearly did drink alcohol and he had no sin, whatever. So again, we're arguing against the idea that wine or drinking of it is intrinsically wrong. Because look at this text from Luke chapter 7. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye, and ye, and ye say that he hath a devil, excuse me, the son of man is coming eating and drinking, and ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, obviously, there's a gross mischaracterization of the Lord here in verse 23, because this is some of his um, antagonistic interlocutors here. They're accusing Jesus of being a glutton and a wine bibber, which obviously he's not because he has no sin. But notice the, the parallelism here with verse 33. John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say that he hath a devil. Okay, so there, um, you know, John the Baptist was one who was a Nazarite. He had taken the Nazarite vow according to the book of Numbers, so he did not want to touch wine or grapes or the vine or anything like that. But look at this, the Son of Man, he does come eating and drinking. Even Luke acknowledges that much, okay? The slanderous part is that he's gluttonous and a wine bibber, but the text does seem to acknowledge that Jesus both ate in terms of feasting and rejoicing and drinking, which would be included in the same. Not only that, but Jesus' first miracle is the miracle of the turning of the water into wine at Cana. So look at this. He saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Okay, so when Jesus turns the water into wine, he doesn't turn it into like grape juice, as our some of our Baptist friends might argue, but rather it's it's the best wine, it's the mature wine, because typically what would happen at these kinds of celebrations is you'd bring out your good wine first, and then people would, you know, they'd be inebriated by it, and then you'd bring out your, your cheap, generic, low-shelf type stuff, and then people would carry on throughout the rest of the night. But when Jesus performs the miracle, he turns the water into that good, rich, a strong, plenteous, abundant, aromatic wine, the kind of good wine that you would celebrate with at, at a wedding. And not only that, but it adds this in verse 11. This is the beginning of the miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Okay, so if the drinking of wine at a celebration like a wedding, for instance, is wrong, well, then what do you argue about what the Lord Jesus did here? But no, Jesus did something good in that he brought this joyful element of celebration and feasting to, to the wedding. And in addition to all of these arguments, my goodness, the Lord's Supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. So interesting that the, these would be the, the bare elemental symbols that the Lord chooses to, um, to portray and to invoke his body and his blood, the bread and the cup. Now, the word doesn't say wine here, but it's pretty obviously implied because this is carrying off of the Passover 
uh, feast and wine was commonly drank at the Passover feast. But if something was intrinsically evil, you would not think that the Lord Jesus would choose and ordain this to be the instituted sacrament of the table, the Eucharist, the communion sacrament. So obviously it can't then be intrinsically wrong to drink because the Lord commends and even requires us to drink at the Lord's table. Paul says to Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Paul recommends this to Timothy, who is also a gospel minister, that he drink a little bit of wine to help settle his belly. Um, so there you go with that. So when we look at the summary of the positive uses of wine or alcohol in, in the Old and the New Testament, it becomes pretty clear that it is used as an offering. It is a blessing to the people of God. It brings about gladness. It is typological of the Messianic age. And it was certainly part and parcel of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did he drink, not only did he make the wine at the wedding of Cana, but he also uses it for the very sacrament of the Lord's table itself. Okay, so that's kind of a lot of, of data to run through. Now, before we go on to the neutral uses, and there are neutral uses, I do want to mention this book right here. It's very interesting. It's called Drinking with Calvin and Luther, A History of Alcohol in the Church by Jim West. So if you've made it this far into this video, I'm going to link this in the description of this video. It's an interesting book talking about the use and the theology of the reformers, especially Calvin and Luther, as it comes to drinking alcohol. Okay, so let's go back to our summary here and move on just a little bit to some of the neutral uses. Now, we've looked at the negative, we've looked at the positive, but there are quite a few neutral uses as well where it doesn't have either a negative or a positive implication to it. So for instance, sometimes the wine press is simply mentioned as a means of identifying a location here. So they slew them at the wine press of Zeb. Okay, that has nothing to do with whether drinking wine is right or wrong. Sometimes it is simply a matter of fact in a narrative story. Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David and his son unto Saul. Okay, that's not necessarily conveying any, any moral worth, either positive or negative. Sometimes it's just part of the narrative of the story itself. Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine. Okay, so it's just part of the story there. Sometimes it's just part of the detail of the text, as in the wine cellars was Zabdi, the ship the ship might, I guess it is, First Chron First Chronicles chapter 27. And then sometimes it's just incidental again to the main plot or the drama of the story. So as in Job chapter 1 verse 13, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. So in summarizing the neutral uses then of wine or alcohol, we could say that it was just part of the culture of the ancient Near East, that sometimes it's mentioned by way of weights or measurements, and sometimes it's just incidental to the narrative, okay? So let's go ahead and look at a summary now of the uses of wine or alcohol in the Bible. One of the things that we're going to notice is that it breaks down fairly fairly neatly into positive, negative, and neutral uses, okay? So again, um, several years ago, I'd done a word search on pretty much every usage of the word wine in the Bible just to make sure I fully understood its implications. And this is a summary table of, of the data, okay? So about a third of the time, it's a negative use. It's a warning, uh, drunkenness, immorality, stay away from it. This is dangerous. Keep your life clear from this. About a third of them are positive uses, joy, blessing, the Messiah, etc., about a third of the references are neutral, they're incidental, they're cultural, they're just part of the narrative, they have no moral implication whatsoever. And then there's a little chunk of them that I would put in the other category, which are just, I just wasn't exactly sure where, where to put that. So um, when I looked at all this data, one of the things that I thought about for myself is, well, it certainly seems then like this is something that is permissible to the Christian. Christians can drink wine, Christians can participate in strong drink. Um, but it does seem to have attached to it a number of additional warnings and cautions to it that at least make some real thinking through the issue seem pretty important, okay? So whether or not you drink alcohol is, of course, up to you to some extent. But I don't think that you're absolutely prohibited from it, especially if you're using it in joyful contexts like weddings or nice dinners or taking your wife out on a date for her birthday, things like that. Somebody invites you over to their house and they serve you a nice dinner and they offer you wine. You should probably just go ahead and take it. At the same time, you do want to be very, very careful of some of its negative uses because some of the negative uses are 
pretty catastrophically negative, okay? And this is where I would say that there are, in fact, some other considerations that you should probably think about for yourself when you're thinking about whether or not you should drink as a, as a Christian believer. First of all, your predisposition. Some of you are genetically predisposed to alcohol addiction. If that is you, you should stay as clear from it as you possibly can. Let me give you a quick test to know whether or not you have this kind of addiction propensity. If you drink, um, we'll do this first. Measure your heart rate, okay? Measure your heart rate and then have a, um, a drink of alcohol. Measure your heart rate again 10 minutes later. If your heart rate raised and it became a stimulant for you, you should probably not drink very much because you're going to be more likely to be the type that is addicted to it and it, it drives you to the kind of silliness and craziness that the Bible warns about. If your heart rate drops after a drink of alcohol, then it's probably more of a sedative for you. You're probably going to be the kind of person that gets tired and just wants to go to bed. By the way, that's the kind of person I am. If I have um, a drink of wine or something like that, I just get sleepy and I just want to go to bed. It makes me want to go to bed. Okay, so I'm not the kind of person that gets out and gets crazy, gets in fights, or wraps my car around a pole. Okay, I'm just the kind of person that it has a sedative effect on me and I just, just want to go to sleep. Your conscience, though, is also something that you should be listening to. Um, yeah, I mentioned conscience in another video a while back and everyone's like, no, what? You, it's not, not the conscience, it's what the Bible says. Okay, well, the Bible talks about the conscience, so the conscience is a guide. Is it an infallible guide? No. Is the scripture infallible? Yes. Okay, but the conscience is still there to help lead you and direct you in cases where the Bible does not give clear and absolute instruction. So if your conscience is constantly sending out warning bells against drinking, you probably shouldn't drink, all right? Not only that, but there are a number of passages that we didn't look at that warn about the weaker brother. What are your actions doing to the other person? Okay, so maybe you're not predisposed to alcohol, alcoholism, but your friend is. Well, maybe I shouldn't drink around my friend then if he is predisposed in that way. And there are a few other things that are relevant to us today that were not relevant back in the times of the scriptures. And that would have to do with heavy, heavy machinery and cars and automobiles and things like that. Obviously, the dangers implied for being inebriated today are greater than those in the times of the Old and New Testament because they didn't, they weren't working on massive cranes or they weren't, uh, they weren't driving their car 75 miles an hour. Uh, they didn't necessarily have big, huge dump trucks and cement trucks and things like that. And I don't know, whatever other kinds of machinery there is. Those are much more cautionary reasons for us to be careful, especially if we have the responsibility over human life that they didn't seem to have in the same way. Maybe you could crash your horse or your chariot in, into a barn or something like that, but probably less likely than us crashing our cars today. Your own mental health is something that you should be very aware of, as well as your physical health. Now, for me, um, the reason I'm drinking a whole lot less these days, not that I ever drank a lot in the first place, um, is because it made me a little bit chubby around the belly, and I didn't like that. So I'm hardly drinking at all these days, other than special occasions, because trying to burn off all of that, um, what is it, the, the ethanol or whatever it is, the body has a hard time metabolizing alcohol, and so that's why you get the beer belly. So for me, I don't want the beer belly, and not only that, but I feel like um, my mind is so much more clear even the next day or the day after that it's just mostly worth it for me to not drink uh, very much at all except for other than special occasions. Okay, so that's what I've got for you today. Now, you can totally disagree with me if you want in, in the uh, comment section. In fact, go ahead and crash those comments really, really hard. Let me know where I'm wrong. Tell me what, what mistakes I've made in this video. You usually do anyways, and that's totally fine. I did want to mention, uh, once again, this interesting book here, Drinking with Calvin and Luther. It's kind of a history of alcohol in the church, especially focusing on the Reformers and the Protestants and such. So I'm going to link this in the description of this video. Also, if you like my really cool Read Fahrenheit 451 t-shirt, which you can hardly see here because I've got it blocked by the mic, uh, my friends Chad and Shauna make those at Cassidy Craft Corner, and you can get that and other church, uh, church shirts that I've designed. Uh, on their website, Cassidy Craft Corner. I'll, I'll link that in the description as well. Okay, that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much for checking into this video. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.